Welcome back to Fade to Black. On the Game Changer Network and KGRA The Planet, I'm your host, Jimmy Church. Our guest tonight, David Jacobs. And his new book is Walking Among Us, and we're actually going to get to that in a second. And we kind of, uh, what I like to do here, and this is the beauty of late night, overnight talk radio, is to uh, paint the picture and and go on a journey. And we are doing just that tonight with, uh, you know, I, I almost want to call you Dr. Jacobs. PhD intimidates the crap out of me, David. It just does. <laughs> and, 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 and so we're painting that picture. And and talking about the Betty and Barney Hill case, which I think is not only a seminal case but and, and an important one, but it's always to me, David, the attention is in the details. And they have that in spades. And then I want to move forward a little bit in the timeline and talk a little bit about Travis Walton because we have another case here where the attention is in the details and it is there. And uh, what do you think about the Travis Walton case? And, and, and how does that make you feel in comparing his case to not only Betty and Barney Hill, but other abduction cases that came later? Yeah, well, I've known Travis for many, many years. He is an absolutely straight shooter. He's uh, extremely intelligent. Uh, I, I believe he graduated from Arizona State as a philosophy major. And uh, uh, he's uh, a, a, a really, really nice guy, a, a good person all the way around. No question. Well, um, he was abducted for five days. Uh, there was a movie made uh, about it that uh, had almost nothing of reality in it in terms of what happened actually happened to him. But the problem was is that he only remembered about 20 minutes of um, a five-day event and did not, uh, as far as I know, do hypnosis to find out uh, anything else. I examined the five-day, a four-and-a-half-day event or whatever it was uh, uh, um, uh, some years back, and I have uh, um, eight uh, three-hour tapes. Uh, in, in those days, we used tape recorders. Uh, I have 24 hours of testimony, essentially, about uh, about what happened to this woman uh, during those five days. So that's a that's a big difference than 20 minutes. Right. Well, and so, uh, so we really don't know what happened to him other than he was abducted. He was in a room, he was on a table, and he went into another room with a weird chair in it, and he sat in it and played with it a little bit, and then he was escorted out, and, uh, and, and uh, something was placed over his face, and he, and he sort of woke up uh, on Earth again, you know, in, his, in, his, in the town he lived in. And, uh, um, and so we don't have a lot of information about it, and... and uh, and Travis does not want to look into it anymore. And he, uh, you know, and but but as, as far as I'm concerned, that happens every once in a while. Somebody will be abducted for two days, three days, five days. Uh, and I've looked at uh, a, a couple of cases like that. Uh, most of the time, the person is um, in the five day case that I looked at, the people had just moved to, to a new state. They did not know anybody in the area where they rented this house. And uh, n neither of them had a job or friends in the area, so nobody missed them. How would uh, how would ET find that out? I I have surmised that if I was you know a little gray cruising around in a craft, right, and I'm flying across the United States, I'm not going to go to a city, right? I'm going to head out uh, where I'm not going to be seen or discovered. If I was on another planet, I would do it this way and and find some lights in the middle of the woods and 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 go there uh it, it, it's the obvious thing it, it's not something that i think is when people try to debunk or be skeptical or discount these cases they don't look at the obvious that's exactly what you would do if you were on the hunt well uh, let me put it this way being sort of on the hunt is it, it, it's not quite a concept because the abduction phenomenon is intergenerational. That is to say, if a person is an abductee, their mother or their father or both were abductees beforehand. And uh, when people start to be abducted, they're usually in early childhood, if not infancy. And uh, it continues with great rapidity, uh, uh, with great repetition, I should say, um, all the way until old age. It stops somewhere in old age. We don't exactly know when, but it would stop somewhere in old age. 
Uh, so people are abducted many, 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 many times. And I can't say many enough to say how many times they've been abducted. For example, if a person is um, uh, 10 years old and uh, he only has uh, uh, um, five abductions a year, which uh, is I've never heard of. That's just not, it's not, not feasible. It's possible, but it's not feasible. I've never had anything like that, that I, in terms of people I've worked with more than once. But um, uh, usually they're abducted many times during the course of the year. But if it's only five times and uh, they're 40 years old and it started when they were 10, uh, that's, that's uh, 30 years of abductions. And uh, at five times three is uh, 150, uh, it's 150 abductions. I think. Right. And uh, most people who know anything about the abduction phenomenon who have been with me for a while would give their right arm to be abducted only 150 times over a 35-year period or whatever it is, or a 30-year period. And it's, it's, uh, uh, it's much, much, much more the, uh, than that. It's many, many times more. So... Uh, um, what was the question again? Not well, well I'm, 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 yeah, that's okay. That's okay. When we're talking about uh, uh, Travis Walton, okay, and there's, well, yeah, let me back up though. All there's right. one thing that happened uh, between Travis and and Betty and Barney Hill that I find interesting. They were both in cars and approached the flying saucer and stopped their cars, right, and got out. Yeah, but that, that's that's typical. That's 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 typical abduction stuff. Right. And 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 so does that when you hear somebody recount uh, 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 um, an experience like that, as opposed to, uh, you know, the alien abduction in the bedroom situation, which is my personal experience, by the way. And oh. then you go to uh, those that now they're not kids. They're adults. They're driving cars. Right. They're adults. And pull over and 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 see a craft and pull over to the side of the road. Then what happens after happens after, you know. So which which part of the abduction experience for you are you suggesting? And this is where I'm going. Are you suggesting that they may have pulled over uh, and and experienced the craft, but they probably had an experience earlier in life too, as well, many times that they didn't know about. Absolutely. Uh, most abductees, I, I'm going to just throw out a number that has no meaning whatsoever, but let's just say 95% of abductees do not know that they're abductees and they might have been abducted hundreds and hundreds of times and still not know that they are abductees. They've led odd lives. They, uh, they, they, they realize that uh, they're in one place uh, in one minute and then suddenly they're in another place and it's three hours later and they... And they can't figure out how they got there or what happened. And they think, oh, well, I must have blacked out or something, you know, uh, or whatever. I, one woman, uh, and I've told the story a couple of times, <clears throat> was in the middle of New York City in the daytime. Uh, she worked on, uh, on, not on Fifth Avenue, on 57th Street, I think. And uh, she uh, had an office and uh, worked for a, a firm. And she, it was 12 o'clock, and she had planned out her lunch hour. Her lunch hour was she was going to go outside uh, to the corner pizza place. She was going to get a slice of pizza, and then she was going to go over to Saks Fifth Avenue and, uh, and shop for the rest of the hour. So she went over, and she got the, uh, the, the pizza, and she uh, walked out with the pizza in her hand. The next thing she knew, it was three hours later, and she was inside a construction area, inside the fence. She was looking down at cranes and so forth in the bottom of this pit where they were building this building. She edged herself around and out through this opening in the fence and um, managed to get back to her office. Her boss said, where the hell have you been? Oh, my God. We, we were just, a, we thought you'd been mugged or something. We we're about to call the police. You know, it's 3 o'clock in the afternoon. She went directly into her office and she called her physician. She says, I think that I have, I've just had a stroke or I have a brain tumor or something. And that is exactly the correct thing to do. Wow. Wow. She did the right thing. She went, she had tests run. There was nothing wrong with her brain whatsoever. And uh, uh, she had no idea what had happened to her. 
And is there yes. an age, David, where people start to recall and remember events from their childhood? No. Most people don't remember events. They don't remember. The abduction phenomenon is clandestine. It is secret. And there's two aspects to that part, uh, that clandestineness, if I may say. Um, number one, you have to keep it first and foremost, you have to keep it secret from the abductee. So, and they're extremely good at that. Uh, and uh, number two, they have to be invisible from time to time. Uh, in other words, in order to be secret, they can't just be flying around and zapping people out of their out of their rooms with other people standing on the sidewalk watching. They can't do that. Uh, so you're looking at a very advanced technology compared to our technology. You know, our technology just began. If you say it began. 200 years ago, which a lot of uh, uh, people, say, historians say about 200 years ago is for advanced technology. That's, one, that, that's, that's nothing in terms of cosmic time. If you say it happened 5,000 years ago, that's also nothing in terms of cosmic time. It's nothing. It's no time at all. So our, our, if, if anybody's going to be slightly more advanced than us, even slightly, they might be hundreds of years more advanced. So we're looking at very advanced technology that allows them to do this in secrecy. Now, they are not perfect. They are living sentient beings and therefore they have imperfections. And every once in a while, people who are standing on the outside will see somebody being abducted from inside their house. That happens from time to time. Uh, the, the Linda Cortile case uh, the, uh, that Bud Hopkins wrote about in a book called Witnessed where people uh, uh, were on the Brooklyn Bridge who watched who all the cars stopped as they watched this. Uh, they watched uh, Linda Curtile flying out of her window with gray aliens and into a UFO. Uh, and uh, that, that, that happens every once in a while. They're not perfect. Uh, but at the same time, uh, the other, in keeping a secret from the uh, abductees, they're really, really, really good at that. And so they, they lead these odd lives. Uh, approaching a uh, people with here, the story you just told me, I, I remember thinking to myself, I've heard this story so many times, I, I became suspicious of it. And the story was a man and his wife, and the kids are driving along in the dark of night, and they're, or the middle of the day, doesn't matter, they're driving along on a highway, and uh, they look out the window, and there's a flying saucer on the left-hand side of the road. And they're approaching it and saying, my God, look at that. That's astounding. That's amazing. The thing flies over the road and then hovers over a field uh, near the near the near where the cars are, but not the, uh, you know f far enough away to be uh, sort of amazing. And it's hovering there. And the guy says, uh, the guy tells me he pulls over to get a better look at the object. Well, I heard that story about 10 million times. I pulled over to the side of the road to get a better look at the object. Well, why didn't he just go slowly and get a better look at the object? Or, I, you know, just something was off. So I started looking into those cases. And, and the ones that I looked into, the person, in fact, uh, was driving along. They saw this object. They were all excited. It flew over to the side of the road. It was hovering there. And then he, the driver, had the urge to just go over to the side of the road and wait. And he waited, and then these gray aliens came out, and they opened the car door, and he walked out with them. And he walked to underneath the UFO, and he went inside it that way. And then this happened, and that happened, and this happened, and that happened, and this happened, and that happened. And then he uh, came back out, and he got back into the car, and then he looked over, and that thing just flew off at fantastic speed. So he put the two parts of the story together. They pulled over and then they saw that thing fly. And he forgot what happened for the hour or an hour and a half, whatever it was in the middle. And uh, that's, that's, that's typical of, of abduction events. And you have to remember that, um, that, that abductees have these odd events happening to them. A lot of them think that it's just normal life, if you can imagine that. This is just the way everybody lives with these odd disjunctures in time and space, with seeing weird things, with, uh, with uh, all sort of, you know, with lights coming in in, the, in their bedroom at, at night and all that. And incidentally, uh, the majority of the people, a majority of abductions that I have looked at uh, since 1986, when I began to do this work, uh, are not happening when the person is asleep. 
I know there's a lot of debunkers out there who feel that this is sleep paralysis, this sort of ridiculous concept that is recycled every 10 or 15 years uh, and uh, it's now back in vogue as a sleep paralysis uh, by people who have no idea what the background of, of, of the debate over this subject, you know. Right, right. And uh, But the majority of the abductees that I have worked with, uh, the majority of their abductions take place when they are not asleep. That ends the sleep paralysis analysis. But uh, the fact is, though, that there are three, and I talk about in the book, there are three pillars of the abduction phenomenon. Number one, it's secret. People do not remember, they should not remember, they're afraid to remember, or they don't even remember that they have, don't have to remember, they just plan to remember. Number two, it's intergenerational. Uh, their mother or their father was an abductee. If they have brothers or sisters, they're all abductees too. When they get married to a non-abductee, their kids will be abductees. Number three, it's uh, global. This is not an American phenomenon. This is a global phenomenon. It is happening all, in all continents. Uh, I cannot say in all countries because I don't know what's happening in North Korea. But it's happening all over the globe, I'll say that. I have personally worked with people from Africa, from India, I mean, I'm sorry, from Asia, from uh, Latin America, uh, obviously from North America, uh, and so forth and so on. It's just, uh, it's just everywhere. Uh, in other words, this is a program we're looking at, and this program has a beginning, a middle, and an end, and it's goal-directed. There's a reason why this is going on, and it's been going on for quite a long time, maybe even for the most part of the 20th century, uh, at least to the 1920s, or where, where uh, when when guy uh, you know when Hopkins did a session with a guy in the 1920s, and uh, so uh, this is a this is a situation where time is not of the essence. They have all the time in the world that they need. And, uh, and it's goal-directed. They're doing this for a reason. So it's not just what I thought it was when I wrote Secret Life. Uh, uh, it was, uh, they were examining us. They were looking us over. They wanted to see what made us tick. Uh, they, you know, and, and that's why they were grabbing people at random, maybe, and all that. And uh, it turns out that that was simply wrong. Uh, when I wrote The Threat, I, I realized that that was not a, a, a looking at us and seeing what makes us tick type program, that it was uh, uh, much more serious than I ever imagined. Uh, these were people who were not just using Earth as a way station to stop here and, and look at the flora and fauna uh, and, uh, and all that. Uh, and uh, it was very, very different than I had imagined. And now that I've written uh, Walking Among Us, it's, uh, I think I've gotten to, uh, I, I can guess what the, what the prospects are, but uh, I don't have any way of knowing for sure even yet. <laughs>